Hi guys, Pastor Matt Chandler here. Pray uh, that this sermon, this resource, uh, be used by God in conjunction with you belonging to a local church uh, to grow you and sanctify you in your faith. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at TBC? You can do that either through the app or you can go online to TBC Resources uh, and give there. Again, pray that this blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. Good morning, church family. My name is David Nichols, and I serve with the group's ministry as well as the leadership program. This morning, I'll be reading out of Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Hey, good morning, TBC. This morning, Ray Ortland, one of my favorite people on earth, is gonna open up the word of God and bless us. Uh, he's been a friend and a mentor, and he's one of those men that I look at and I go, like that. Love my wife like that, love my church like that, love Jesus like that. And so we guys welcome to the stage, Ray Ortland. Jenny and I are overjoyed to be with you again. Thank you for inviting us back. This is pure delight to us. And it's great to see you all flourishing as a church with Matt and Lauren. We're glad they can get some rest. We miss them today, but we'll see them again soon. Now, our verse was just read to us, this wonderful, atomically weighted, industrial strength, rugged encouragement in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. For of this one thing I am sure, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now, here's where we're going today. Okay, here's what the touchdown looks like. The Apostle Paul says that to us. He says, here's something I am certain of that God, who began a good work in you, will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. All right? Now, behind the Apostle Paul, God himself is moving Paul to say this. God is saying to us today, of this I am certain, that I, who began a good work in you, will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. So that today... By faith, even by a defiant, cheerful faith in Christ, we plant our flag in Philippians 1.6, and we say, of this we are sure, that he who began a good work in me, he who began a good work in you, will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. So we walk out of here today confident, not in ourselves, Let's all face our, our weaknesses and shortcomings with utter realism. That's why this verse is in the Bible. Philippians 1, 6 is in the Bible for Christians who stink at Christianity. <laughs> because we're not always going to be like this. God has begun a good work. And what God begins, he completes wonderfully. So we take our stand there today in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And here's why today is a very special day for me and for Janny. My dad, the man I respected most in all my life, was born 100 years ago today. July 9th, 1923 in Des Moines, Iowa. Here's my dad preaching. My dad was a profound Christian. He was a faithful husband. He was an attentive father. He was a wholehearted pastor and hands down, greatest preacher I've ever heard, and he didn't even know it, which is the best way. My dad was such a dear friend to me, better than I deserved. This was taken in 1975 here in Dallas at my graduation from seminary, very 70s-ish, <laughs> sort of. I'm glad that decade is over. The 60s were awesome. The 70s were a disaster. Don't even get me started. Now, this is the Bible my dad gave me on my 17th birthday. As I was going into my senior year in high school, this very Bible right here. 
And 1966, I was, uh, it was the first week of two-a-day football practices in, in September. I, I it was a Wednesday. I was tired. We did win the uh, league championship that fall. Uh, not that anybody cares anymore, but... <laughs> Oh, man, we had so much fun. We even played some of our home games in the Rose Bowl there in Pasadena. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. So Mom fixed a really nice dinner for me that evening. Dad gave me this Bible. And here is the inscription that he wrote at the very front. Bud, nothing could be greater than to have a son, a son who loves the Lord and walks with him. Your mother and I have found this book our dearest treasure. That's an amazing thing to say to a 17-year-old knucklehead. I needed my dad to say that to me. We give it to you, and doing so can give nothing greater. Be a student of the Bible, and your life will be full of blessing. We love you, Dad, Philippians 1.6. Wow. Yeah. That means a lot to me. So before we go any further, let me just ask you dads and moms, have you said that yet to your children? Go ahead and say it. And maybe you're thinking, but, you know, your dad was, was a saint. He was. I'm no saint. How could I say that to my children with, with credibility? But... Imperfect but sincere Christian parents are ideally positioned to commend the grace of God to their children. And you've got to say this to your kids. In the normal course of events, they're under your roof at your dinner table for what, 17, 18 years? That's time enough for the truly glorious, sacred, urgently significant things to be said that must be said. The world will never tell your children that this is a treasure. The world will tell your children that money is the treasure and the world will break their hearts. You've got to say this about the Bible to your children and you can, so just go ahead and do it. Just do it by faith in Christ. And if you will, then, my dad gave this to me 57 years ago. If you'll do this today, 50 plus years from now, after your voice in this world has fallen silent, you will still be speaking to your children. They will be listening more than ever. And they will be strengthened for whatever they're going to be facing out in that unknown future. So dad cited Philippians 1.6, which was perfect. So the very first verse I ever turned to in this Bible was, of course, Philippians 1, 6, and I turned to it, and I underlined it, and there it is. And I am sure that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Here's why that was, in the most wonderful way, kind of a direct hit. I loved the Lord in a way, but honestly, most days, what I really cared about was football, rock and roll, and being cool. I was not exactly a profound young man. But my dad was not perceiving me in the moment. He was thinking of my future. He, was, he, was, he gave this to me in hope. He gave this to me with a prayer that eventually I would treasure this assurance. And I did, eventually. I mean, that's the whole point of the verse, that God is involved, something deeper than our own good intentions and hopes for the future. God has come, and thanks to God's grace, which is the whole point of the verse, man, Philippians 1.6 became one of the go-to verses for me in the Bible. When my heart was broken, when I saw my own betrayals and stupidity, this was the verse I turned to, to get stable again and keep going. So today, I am passing on, in the name of the Lord, through my dad, through me, to you, this rugged, world-class, 
it takes a licking and keeps on ticking kind of verse. Because this has, this has gotten me through more, through more than one scrape. And I'm sure so many of us could say the same about this wonderful verse. So let's just enjoy it, dig into it. Let's take it in three sections. And the first section is, is going to speak to, more to your heads, and, and the second and third parts of the verse are going to speak more to your hearts, okay? So, number one, he says, and I am sure of this. What a fascinating thing to say. Hmm. And I am sure of this. What are you sure of? What makes you say, oh, yeah. We're talking now about convictions. There's a difference between conviction and opinion. Opinions sort of float on the surface of our minds. And our opinions matter, but, but they don't go really deep. Like, here's an opinion of mine. Eric Clapton is the greatest guitarist of all time. Yep. Am I right? Okay. <laughs> it's my opinion. I might be wrong, but I don't think so. Convictions are just, they just go deeper. They're, they're next level. Our convictions are certainties where we take our stand, come what may. So opinions can collapse under the pressure of oh, just the buffetings of this life. But convictions get us through deep troubles because God's grace enters into us and goes through our opinions down into that deep place of conviction. God's grace claims us helps us, encourages us, gives us strength, hope, courage at that deep level. So our convictions can be wrong. We, I'm sure we'd all have stories to tell about how we've changed deeply. Things that we used to think were just obviously right now, we think, oh my goodness. We've changed. But we can't live without convictions. And everyone is sure of something. Even if you happen to believe this morning that everything is stupid and nothing is worthy of your all, that itself is a firm conviction. So wait on deep. What are you sure of? What do you just know? Marilyn Robinson, in her book, The Death of Adam, helps us understand the the convictional mentality, this sort of, this outlook that is, it's like this ocean we're all swimming through every day in these dark days. And she gives voice to that conviction. Here's what she says. When a good man or woman stumbles, we say... I knew it all along. And when a bad one has a gracious moment, we sneer at the hypocrisy. It is as if there is nothing to mourn or admire, only a hidden narrative, now and then apparent through the false surface narrative, and the hidden narrative, because it is ugly and sinister, is therefore true. Now, that outlook, if that's what you're sure of, I'm guessing your heart has been broken. But you're also on a path for your heart to get even more broken. So let's reconsider. Here is where Christianity takes us down at this deep level of conviction. We 
become, by God's grace, listening to the gospel, God changes the subject at a deep conviction level. We become sure that evil and darkness and everything we fear, those horrible realities we become convinced are not primary, original, and enduring. We come to realize evil and darkness are secondary, derivative, parasitic. We come to see evil and darkness are distortions of truth and beauty, which means that truth and beauty are primary, original, and enduring. So maybe, by God's grace, this morning, you are fed up enough to begin to doubt your doubts and rethink what you're sure of. There's another path. God is opening it up to you today. Here's what you stand to gain. The Apostle Paul who wrote this was, he was a serious man. He was not a dreamer. He was not an idealist. He was a realist. He faced life as it is. He looked at these early Christians there in Philippi. They had no power, no advantages, no privilege. And this serious-minded man looks at them, and he knows they aren't model Christians. He wrote the letter for one reason. Part of the reason was to talk to them about their problems. He looks at them as they are, and he is convinced that their future is bright. And we here today are not model Christians. Not a single one of us can say, y'all, check me out. I mean, I mean, that would just, it's laughable. Why did we get in our cars and drive down to church today? Not because we're such great Christians, but because we're not. And we just know we need help. We're all in. So Paul looked at the, those people in Philippi. He looks at us today, and Paul and my dad are convinced we have something to get excited about. We have something to look forward to. We have something to be sure of and to believe in. We have something in our future that's worth reaching for. And they're inviting us to become convinced as well. So Philippians 1.6 is in the Bible How do I say this? The cheerful defiance of Philippians 1.6 is daring us as a, a friend, daring us to go ahead and believe in God and His grace that God loves to give His best to the undeserving. <laughs> Let's not project our darkness and our pettiness and smallness onto God. Let's look at him and, whoa, he just thinks in a totally different way. God, for reasons we, we don't understand, loves to give his best to the undeserving. <laughs> so, like, sign me up, right? That's why we're in church today. And Philippians 1, 6 helps us to just enjoy it and savor it and dare to believe it, and we will defy even the barriers our follies have erected in between ourselves and that better future we really want to enter into. It's, it's not as though God didn't foresee that. He knew what we would cost him before he ever stepped in. He's fine with this. He likes this arrangement. He's not tired of you. He's not looking at his peripheral vision for an exit strategy. He's glad you're here, and he's inviting you. Dare to believe it. Now, if it ever happens that I open up this Bible to Philippians chapter 1, and oh my goodness, there's a blank in the page between verses 5 and 7, okay, then I've got a problem. And then if I turn to you, hey, can I see your Bible? And, and we compare, and yours is gone too? Okay, then we'll have something to worry about. But as long as 
That verse is on the page. Those words. We can be sure. We can be sure. We have every right in Christ to be sure. You see, the gospel doesn't just sort of rearrange our opinions here and there a little bit. It's a whole new outlook. And here's why it's it's this total newness. We stop making ourselves the center that keeps us stuck where we are. The gospel teaches us to see Jesus as our primary central reality, redefining our future in terms of his grace alone. And the gospel is out to convince us that we never deserved it to begin with, therefore we don't need to sustain it now. We can just receive it. That's our only part. We hold out the empty hands of faith before the Lord, and we receive, and we receive, and we receive, and we receive without end. And the risen Christ above, he's not depleted. There's something about him. Again, we don't understand this. The more he gives, the more he has to give. And the more generous we experience him to be, the more he enjoys it. It's like he's the opposite of of how this world works. So we can never be sure of ourselves. Let's not be sure of ourselves, but we can always be sure of him. And if you need help getting there into that place of confidence at a conviction level, if you need help getting to the place where you can say, of this I am sure, (laughs) well, I'm sorry, but you actually need more help than you think. The gap is bigger than you even perceive, but that's okay with him. He meets you where you are. If you see 1% of your need and you offer that to him, he in that moment gives you 100% of his grace. He's not holding back. He's got this. Why would you hold back? So that's the first part. Of this I am sure. Secondly, that he who began a good work in you, he began a long time ago. Jesus lived the virtuous life for us that we've never lived. Jesus died the atoning death we don't want to die. He did that for us. Jesus rose up from it all with newness of life, undiable life forever that he promises to all who come to him. And that Jesus is not a, just a distant historic figure way back then that we sort of look back at, back to and, and imitate, though that's true, but he's just more. Jesus is now a person living within us. He, God's grace, relocates the benefits of Jesus inside us, he who began a good work in you. This is not behavior modification, though that comes in handy now and then, doesn't it? But the Bible says God is writing his law on our hearts, not just he takes the words on the page of the Bible and he's inscribing these words on the deepest impulses of our personalities, down below conscious choice. Profound transformation. The Bible says he is working in us what is pleasing in his sight. So God is, he began a good work in you. He's busy today. And God is not up there scrambling, running around trying to hold this crazy world together. He's building a new world. He's having a blast doing it. And we who belong to Jesus are the early makings of his new world. Now, we don't look like it because he has begun this work in us. Great thing is, we didn't recruit him. We don't motivate him. He made the first move. He keeps us moving. His commitment is long term. And it's a good work. There's no bitter aftertaste in anything that he puts into our lives. He who began a good work in you, no one will ever end up, no one with Jesus will ever end up wishing for a do-over without Jesus. It's not going to happen. Now, maybe 
when we first cross the line from holding back, holding out, and we cross the line to, okay, Lord, you win, we, we opened up and we received him. Maybe our thought at the time was, and I think mine was, okay, he's forgiving me. He's wiping the slate clean. I really appreciate that because now that gives me the chance to prove to him I've got the right stuff. This time I can get it right, and I'm re-upping. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Real Christianity doesn't work that way. Not at all. In Christ, you're not on probation. You're on track for his complete grace forever. And it's a good thing, too, because it doesn't take us, we all know, it doesn't take us long to totally fall on our faces after we receive Christ. And we discover our, our old temptations are still strong. We discover our bad habits cannot perform our good intentions. And our failures are why Philippians 1.6 is in the Bible for us. It's for us. Real Christianity is not you showing that you have what it takes. Real Christianity is Christ proving himself to you over and over again. Now, this is total gospel, total grace. God's law tells us to behave better. Well, good. I need that. I need God's law to tell me. And sometimes I just have to grab myself by the scruff of the neck and say, Ray Ortland, you will go do the right thing. Okay, that's fine. But God's grace doesn't just tell us to behave better. God's grace makes us better. That's amazing. God's law tells us what to do. Again, that's good, but God's grace promises what we will be. Is effort involved? Our effort? Yes. Is earning involved? No. It's all of grace. So every one of us who's looking to Jesus, we are two realities all the time simultaneously. We are flawed and we are miraculous. Let's face our flaws and own up to them and make them right. Let's look at the miracles and breathe a sigh of relief. He's going to get us there. He's not embarrassed by his own good work. He's excited about your future. Maybe you could get excited about your future too. All right, third part. He will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful for this. God apparently has taken a great big red marker and drawn a circle around a day on the calendar. We don't know when this day is. But that will be the final day of human history when Christ returns. That's when on the big screen, the end will appear on the screen. And then we'll see the credits. Hope. Jesus Christ. Wisdom, Jesus Christ. Sacrifice, Jesus Christ. Successful outcome, Jesus Christ, and so forth. <laughs> and we'll all be cheering, rejoicing our fool heads off. So God has decided that day on the calendar, it's coming. Our Lord will conclude history, He will judge all evil forever. He will confirm and perfect all good forever. The Bible says he will separate the sheep from the goats. And on that great and glorious day, if you belong to Jesus, God will complete his work in you, including your very body, the humblest part of you, everything about you, your personality, your, your speech, your relational sensitivities, your wisdom, your emotional instincts, your memories, your innermost self that only he sees, and so forth. His gracious touch will make you magnificent forever. He's not just going to patch you up a little bit here and there. You're going to be amazing to the praise of the glory of his grace. And everybody in heaven will like you. <laughs> so, Philippians 1 6 is in the Bible for a reason. And the reason is, it's obvious, let's all admit it, we're weak, 
We are confused at times. We are irresolute. We're fearful. But now, with this verse, Philippians 1, 6, whatever happens, we can be sure of God. We never know what tomorrow brings. We always know who our Lord is. And what matters more to who I am than who I am is who he is for me. Same for you. And so we rejoice in who he is. We are sure of him. Come what may. Now, at Emmanuel Nashville, um, sometimes we have this responsive reading that we stole from William Bridge, an old Puritan theologian. He wrote a book entitled A Lifting Up for the Downcast, 1648. He went to Exodus chapter 34 where God revealed his heart to Moses and Bridge wrote this sort of Q&A, like, sort of like FAQs about God in relation to the undeserving. That's all of us. And so what we're going to do is, is we're going to do this together, okay, this responsive reading. I've been preaching the gospel to you. Now you are going to preach the gospel to me. So let's all stand. Here we go. And I'm just going to ask the question, and we're all going to read the answer. Oh, but this, let's just jump at the last slide real quickly. Okay, here's the very last one. Now, do you see at the bottom of the th last three words, isn't this awesome? Okay, now... That's like we just won the Super Bowl <laughs> in double overtime and defeated the bad guys, and this is the party after the game, okay? So the isn't this awesome is boom. So let's just practice it once, okay? All right, you ready? All right. On three. One, two, three. Isn't this awesome? Oh, baby, yeah. Now we're talking. Okay, let's back it up. Here we go. Who is God? He is the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. But does God really want to help me he is a God merciful and wants to help. But what is there in me to move him to care? He is a God gracious, motivated by his own love. But I've been sinful and backward for too long. He is a God slow to anger. But I've sinned extremely, blatantly, aboundingly. He is a God abounding in steadfast love. But I'm weak and unfaithful to him. He is a God abounding in faithfulness. But God works only with big, important people. He keeps steadfast love for thousands. But I've sinned in so many different ways. He forgives iniquity and transgression and sin, all kinds. But if I let myself believe this, it makes God seem unserious. He will by no means clear the guilty, but any sinner may have God as his faithful friend through Christ. Of this we are sure, because it is all by God's grace. Isn't this awesome? <laughs>